The Psychological Impact of Critical Illness by Jillian Colville Hello, my name is Gillian Colville. I'm a paediatric psychologist based in London in the UK at St George's Hospital. Um, I'm going to talk about the psychological impact of critical illness and in, in particular trying to highlight the priorities for research. Um, this is uh, uh, my hospital, St George's in South London. We've recently acquired a helipad, as you can see from the photograph, and uh, that was exciting at first, but um, it, obviously we, we, it's increased our workload and has presented a few challenges, particularly in relation to uh, traumatic experiences uh, for children and parents. Um, I wanted to start with a quote uh, from a recent editorial in PCCM, which I think sums up the position at the moment as regards a new appreciation of the importance of outcomes in intensive care. Uh, the quote starts with the title, After the Fairy Tale Ending, and that's referring to the great success we've had recently in intensive care in terms of uh, survival of children. But as it goes on to say, Sleeping Beauty, so that the patient is now needing physical therapy, uh, extra tutoring at school, and what's more, her mother has post-traumatic stress disorder. It's, it's worth considering why there's been a, an increasing interest in outcomes recently. And part of the reason is actually a very positive one. In the past, the main outcome we looked at was mortality. But thankfully, the mortality rates have dropped considerably in the last two decades. Um, but what that means is statistically, you need huge samples in order to, to show any difference in mortality. So one of the reasons that people are looking at other outcomes is a statistical one that they need um, to find an outcome that's easier to measure in smaller samples. But there is also a growing appreciation of the extent of post-ICU uh, morbidity in children. In fact, Murray Pollock has recently suggested that it's possible that we've traded mortality for increased morbidity and uh, it, it, we need to check uh, what sort of quality of life children have after they leave ICU. There's also a greater appreciation more widely about the importance of psychological and quality of life issues in relation to health. And this in part reflects the World Health Organization definition of health as being more than just the absence of ill health. And I think with the appreciation of PICS, which is the acronym for post-intensive care syndrome that's recently been adopted by SCCM, the Society of Critical Care Medicine in uh, America, there's a more a, a bigger appreciation of this syndrome in patients and in their families. Um, that syndrome's referred to as PICS-F, so post-intensive care syndrome in families. Um, and that's, that's another factor, I think. The three topics I want to raise as, as being important in terms of future research into outcomes are delirium, its presence and associations in the paediatric population, the importance of screening and monitoring of psychological symptoms in children after PICU and, and their parents, and the value of psychological interventions with this population. So I'll start with delirium. And I think the, the big question here is, is delirium associated with worse ICU outcomes in children? There's evidence in the adult population that there are significant rates of delirium on ICU, but there's very little information on children. And this, this is starting to change. Uh, previously, there were no established tools or there was certainly a lack of consensus on which tools to use. But lately, a couple of promising tools have emerged uh, from the research that, that should make these questions easier to answer. Also importantly, um, there are, there's evidence in the adult literature that there's an association between delirium and particular forms of morbidity and mortality rates. And I think it, given that, it's important that uh, we look into this issue in paediatrics too. <laughs> 
there's also evidence in some studies that interrupted sedation in, in the, with adult ICU patients reduces delirium and reduces length of, length of stay. And again, it would be interesting to repeat these studies with a paediatric population. Although having said that, a, a recent Dutch study uh, didn't find that interrupted sedation reduced delirium. The link between delusional experiences that can occur in delirium and later PTSD in adults is another uh, important topic and one that's been of particular interest to me. And in, in fact, this, this study, uh, the Jones study in 2001, uh, prompted me to see whether there was a similar sort of ex uh, relationship in paediatric patients. The measures of delirium that I mentioned earlier, the, the sort of main ones around at the moment, are the paediatric CAM ICU. There's also a, a preschool version of this recently come out with the same author, uh, Smith et al. There's the paediatric anaesthetic emergence delirium scale, which has been adapted slightly by the Cornell group. Um, it's an observational measure which doesn't require interaction with the child. Um, and that, that is also sort of gathering interest. So my interest as a psychologist is really in the delusional experiences that uh, people have when they're delirious. And once I'd read the Jones paper I, and couldn't find anything on children in this situation, I, I uh, decided to apply for some uh, research money to look into this more systematically. And I was partly prompted by what I'd read, but I was also prompted by the nature of referrals I was being asked to see. So I was regularly being referred children who were behaving very strangely when they got off ICU. Although usually two or three days later, they, they were much calmer. Um, and in the course of interviewing these children and interviewing other children in pilot research work, I learned that they had had often very harrowing experiences which they couldn't make any sense of. Um, they'd seen and heard things that couldn't possibly have happened but were clearly very frightening. Um, so in this study that I did of 102 children at Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, I established that around two thirds remembered something factual about their admission. This was interesting because until this point, all I'd been able to find were mentions in textbooks to the effect that drugs such as the benzodiazepines that children are often put on for sedation usually wiped their memories completely. And I heard on a number of occasions, I heard doctors reassuring parents that the child wouldn't remember anything. Um, well, it turned out they do remember some things, albeit uh, patchily. And in fact, a lot of the things they remember are fairly innocuous. They might remember somebody bringing them a balloon or the first time they saw their mom. Um, and in, in this, my findings were similar to those of Play4 et al in 2000, who found similar sorts of memories in children. But about a third of the children didn't remember anything of their admission and were understandably confused when they woke up. Um, more worryingly, about a third of the children reported very strange delusional experiences, which they could still remember three months later. They had hallucinations, um, strange dreams, nightmares, and the conviction that people were trying to hurt them. And in this, they were very similar to adult ICU patients who report similar experiences. They sometimes incorporated pictures or murals on the walls uh, opposite the bed they were in into their hallucinations. Uh, one boy in particular uh, woke up to find a cartoon character six foot high and wielding a, a, an axe over his head when he woke up from elective surgery. Another boy talked of experiencing uh, the feeling that scorpions were crawling all over him. Um, he could see them and he could feel them, so he actually had tactile hallucinations. Um, and he said that that was more frightening looking back than the accident he'd been involved in and that he'd had the scorpions crawling all over him for about three days. So, I mean, that's a very frightening experience. And whereas an adult might be able to later rationalise such an, as an experience as presumably a hallucination, 
a child might not be so sure that um, intensive cares, care units were free of scorpions. So a child mightn't be sure whether or not this had really happened. And you could speculate that children might be more susceptible to uh, longer lasting distress as a result of these sort of hallucinations. I found that the there was a, an association with medication. I know this isn't always found with delirium or, or with um, these experiences. But in this study, I found that there was a clear uh, relationship with the extent of time children were on opiates. Um, although that was a, a statistical separation out of opiates and benzodiazepines. In, in reality, most of the children on our units are on both drugs. And when I analysed the data with regard to whether or not the child had been on opiates or ben and ben benzos for more than two days, there was a five-fold increased risk of them having delusional experiences. In terms of links with subsequent PTSD scores at three months, there were no associations in this sample with age, sex or length of stay, but the emergency uh, admitted kids and the kids with more severe illness did have higher post-traumatic stress scores than the other children. But what was interesting was that even when you controlled for emergency admission and illness severity, the delusional memories added additional variance in uh, PTSD scores, whereas the factual memory memories didn't uh, increase their risk of having high PTSD scores. The second topic I think we need more information on is uh, is really how should how best should we be screening and monitoring children and families if they are at risk of. Uh, uh, PICU-related distress that continues beyond the admission. Uh, there is a nice guideline in the UK which advises against uh, offering blanket interventions to populations who are at risk of developing PTSD and calls for more screening of such populations. And I'd argue um, that PICU families are, are just such a population. We know that these families are at risk. There is, there's now quite a body of literature showing repeatedly significant proportions of parents and of children scoring in at-risk ranges on post-traumatic stress measures in particular. Um, and we also know from studies that PTSD impacts on the wider uh, health-related quality of life. But there is a question here as to whether it's intensivist job to flag up those at highest risk and whether it's the intensivist job to continue to monitor them. I mean, I think these are all questions that are open to debate. But I think what isn't open to debate is that something needs to happen. We, we can't keep gathering this information and not uh, do something with it. Um, if, if we do decide to monitor them, it's important to achieve some sort of consensus as to which measures we should use and how long we should monitor families for. Now, when I looked at this sample that I mentioned earlier, I found about a third of them scored above the cutoff uh, for post-traumatic stress at three months. I was fortunate enough to get an extension to the project to go back to the same children at a year. And what was interesting was that some of the children who had seemed OK at three months had become newly symptomatic by a year. And I think this is evidence that it isn't enough to monitor them for two or three months. It's important to go on following them or, or to establish uh, that their primary care, health care workers are continuing to bear this distress in mind. The other thing I found was that although some of the children who were symptomatic at three months had improved at a year, about half of them were still symptomatic. And I think it's these two groups, the newly symptomatic at a year and the chronically symptomatic at a year that I would be most concerned about as a psychologist. The predictors of post-traumatic stress in children that I've found seem to be emergency admission and, as I mentioned earlier, these strange delusional experiences during or soon after uh, intensive care admission. I found that parents' rates of post-traumatic stress were higher than children's at three months, so around 45% of parents had uh, scores above the cutoff. 
at three months compared to just under 30% of children. At a year, similar proportions of parents and children were still reporting high levels of post-traumatic stress. But as I indicated earlier, it, it wasn't always the same children and parents that were reporting the symptoms uh, as had been at three months. When you take a snapshot of the picture at a year, but just over half of families are doing well in, uh, as measured by the parent and child score, but half of families contained at least one member of the pair with a high score, and there were 10% of families where both the parent and the child scored above cutoff on post-traumatic stress measures. I did a little bit of looking at the interrelationships between the parents' and children's scores. I think on our unit, we, we assumed that if a parent was very upset, they would make the child more upset. But actually, I, f I didn't find evidence statistically for that hypothesis. What I did find, though, was that uh, avoidance symptoms in children at three months seem to be predictive of uh, high scores in parents at a year. And we've done some qualitative research since this original study and it, it seems this is quite a live issue that parents struggle sometimes to get the child to talk about what happened and that parents get upset about this. Um, other parents don't know how to talk about what happened and clinically when we get involved with families we try sometimes to help them put the story together in the interests of both parties. Screening parents for risk Obviously, there are issues regarding uh, sort of piling up questionnaires uh, when parents are preoccupied with whether their child's going to live or die. It's not appropriate to ask them to fill in lots of measures uh, very acutely. But there are a couple of promising measures which I've used in studies, which I think uh, are, which have proved to be associated with later distress. The first of them is quite an old measure invented in 1989 by Carter and Miles. That's the Parental Stressor Scale, PICU version. And the other measure which I found uh, to have some utility is the Post Traumatic Adjustment Scale, which was developed in Australia for use with injured adults, but, but I think does have some relevance here. Um, I used the PSS PICU retrospectively in a paper uh, that came out in 2006 and I found that parents scores, when parents were asked to fill this in eight months after the admission, so that's filling it in retrospectively, there was an association with their current levels of distress. Uh, that led me to use it prospectively in another study. And again, it held up uh, in that it, the, the, the way people scored their acute distress in relation to specific aspects of their experience on PICU was related to their later post-traumatic stress scores um, five or six months later. In addition, I found that the high stress uh, families, the high stress parents, were more likely to benefit from a follow-up clinic intervention that we provided. Um, that's covered in the paper indicated on the slide. The other measure, the post-traumatic adjustment scale, um, we used prospectively again. We gave it to parents 48 hours after discharge and then followed them up uh, seven months later. And it, th this measure sort of identified about 38% 30, of parents as being at risk and uh, subsequent data showed that this group were were more at risk of significant scores, but there were a lot of false positives. So as the authors acknowledge in other samples, this measure might be useful more for excluding low risk people than for identifying definite uh, cases of uh, risk of post-traumatic stress at follow up. The last question is the biggest question, the $64,000 question. What, what, are we, what can we do for these families? What can we do for these parents and for these children? And the answer is we don't fully know yet, but there are some suggestions and some ideas and some things that people have tried, although this is a field that's ripe for further investigation.
Um, if I, I've sort of already covered a little bit about what we might be able to do, I've touched on what we might be able to do on PICU to reduce distress in children acutely and later on in terms of the possibilities as regards reducing delirium. Uh, if, if it turns out that delirium is associated with over sedation, which is one possibility, then that's something we might be able to do something about. If it turns out that uh, more psychoeducation about delirium for the child and for the family it might reduce initial anxiety, that might also lead to uh, lower rates of distress in the longer term. I now want to talk a bit about what we can do post-discharge to hopefully reduce dis uh, distress in parents and children. Um, a number of things have been tried in the adult ICU world. One of these is the use of patient diaries. Uh, another avenue that I think is worth exploring is the use of follow-up clinics and more generally the value of psychoeducation leaflets and materials for families. There is evidence that patients appreciate diaries and that there is a positive in, impact on their symptoms and, and on their family's symptoms. Uh, the, these two studies are uh, quite promising in this regard, but as I say, they're on adult patients. I should say that there's also evidence that not everyone wants a diary. I think there's a, a risk sometimes that with this kind of research that people get carried away and assume because a couple of patients like something that everyone will like it, but it, it, it appears that there are a number of patients who would rather not have a diary. I think the, the, fact, the fact is that uh, we can't make diaries for most of our patients because they're very young. In, in the UK, the median age of admission is one. So uh, you know, the vast majority of the children on PICU, certainly in the UK, are too little to make sense of a diary. But it could be that diaries are useful for parents and that may give them a way to make sense of what's happening and to make notes on uh, individual events and uh, significant changes in the child or visits or, or whatever is happening while they're in ICU. Um, I think in relation to the older children, there's also potentially some scope for storybooks with older children to help them understand what happened to them. And I have, this is something I occasionally try with children, if, especially if they've been in for a long time. So this is in my clinical role. Um, and where what's happened is quite hard to, for the parents to explain. Um, over the a number of years now, I, I've made individualised books and I've tried to tailor them to the developmental stage of the child. So the, the first book I've got illustrated on this slide was for a boy who'd had a, experienced a very serious 40% burn and spent three months in hospital. And he found this book useful uh, in terms of helping his classmates understand what had happened to him when he went back to school. The middle book was for a child who had necrotizing fasciitis after infected chickenpox. And um, the, this book was much appreciated by this particular child who was only three. Um, and the third illustration is of a calendar I put together in at quite short notice for an older boy who'd sustained a serious injury, but only spent a, a few days at our hospital. Um, and I think all, all of them were useful in that they provided the child with something tangible uh, to help them understand their uh, period in hospital after they were sufficiently recovered to make more sense of what had happened. Um, Follow-up clinics are uh, provided in about 30% of adult centres uh, in the UK. They're not always, they're not particularly well evaluated and there's a, a, a lack of uh, um, strict evidence base for their effectiveness, but they are um, sort of anecdotally very well received by patients and relatives. Um, they, they're mentioned in the UK Department of Health guidelines for follow-up after intensive care but um, with this proviso that they should be offered to those who would benefit. At the moment, the problem is we don't know who, who benefits from them.
Um, I tried offering one at St George's um, using the PSS, PICU prospectively, as I mentioned earlier, and randomising parents to a follow-up appointment two months after discharge and then following them all up. And there wasn't an overall effect of the clinic, but when we did some post hoc analyses and looked at the high stress group that I showed you on a previous slide, so that's the parents that scored above the median score on the PSS PICU, there was uh, an effect of being offered the appointment for that group, which was significant both in relation to their subsequent depression symptoms and their post traumatic stress symptoms. Um, and on the basis of those results, we went on to do another study in Bristol Children's Hospital, which uh, I, I, uh, I can, which is covered in my website if you want to find out more about that. I'll just finish by saying a little bit about the treatment work I do with parents. As I said, most of the patients on PICU are very small. And although we can help a little bit with the older children and I do see them from time to time to talk about what happened and to talk about their reintegration back into school after they've, particularly after they've been off for a long time. Um, in practice, a large chunk of my clinical work is actually with parents and that's both uh, in order to help parents themselves but also indirectly to help the, ch the child because if the parents can get on top of their symptoms, they're in a better position to support the child emotionally in their recovery. And one promising uh, brief treatment I've been using recently for post-traumatic stress disorder is narrative exposure therapy. In it, um, I, I see a parent twice a week for three or four weeks consecutively, and we put together a full account of the experiences on PICU and and fit that in basically to their life story and what we end up with is a typed account of all their experiences and a diagram, a, a lifeline diagram which has marked on it uh, difficult experiences and high points uh, during their life and during the particular traumatic admission. Uh, this is an example of one parent whose symptoms were not remitting naturally over time. He was referred to me about nine months after his child's discharge from PICU. But with the institution of the therapy, there was a, a, a significant drop in his post-traumatic stress symptoms and his anxiety symptoms. Um, I'll just finish by uh, thanking you for listening and highlighting a number of resources that are available free of charge uh, to download on my website, uh, which is given on this slide. Thank you. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.